we're named after Norman Lear for two important reasons. One is he's been incredibly generous to the work that we've done. And the other is that I can't think of a better name to symbolize the kind of stuff that we care about, which is using entertainment to inform, to enlighten, to inspire, to discuss, to start fights, to end fights, and, and all the ways in which you can be engaged in the world through the vehicle of entertainment. So uh, tonight we're going to have a, a panel that will uh, focus on cancer, and to introduce it will be the director of our Hollywood Health and Society program. She is joined tonight by lots and lots of uh, people who are staff and volunteers of Hollywood Health and Society and of the Lear Center. They do an amazing job. We're really grateful for their dedication and uh, uh, the leader of Hollywood Health and Society to kick things off, Sandra de Castro Buffington. Thank you, Marty. So welcome, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. As many of you know, Hollywood Health and Society has been working with Hollywood's creative community for more than 10 years now. We actually help writers connect with medical experts to access accurate medical information for their scripts. And this year, we actually launched the signature Story Bus Tour series. And there are some people here tonight with us who were on our first tour to East LA, where we met former gang members, children who had been impacted uh, by violence. And we met some of the innovative leaders and programs that are, are helping them. We also this year took a group of writers and producers overseas to India and to South Africa to help them learn about global health in a local context. So tonight, we are so pleased to bring together this incredible panel of experts to talk to us about one of the most important health topics of our time. Cancer affects people of all ages, all walks of life, and can be found in every country in the world. Who in this room has not been impacted by cancer? Some of us are survivors, others have family members who've been affected by the disease, and some of us have simply witnessed our favorite characters on the screen grappling with cancer. We've seen a huge surge in storylines about cancer. It's the basis for Showtime's The Big C, AMC's Breaking Bad, and it factors as an important storyline on the CW series 90210. People who've had cancer are leading the way with innovative programs like Fran Drescher's Cancer Schmancer Movement and I'm too young for this cancer foundation. Did you know there are 24 cancer survivors gardens in the United States? I, I visited the one in Chicago. They were established by Richard Block, uh, who survived what he had been told was terminal lung cancer. He and his wife set up these gardens to help others fight and recover from cancer. And all the parks include a positive mental attitude walk. And they have inspirational messages and informative messages like, realize that cancer is a life-threatening disease, but some beat it. Make up your mind that you will be one of those who do. Another is 11 million Americans have been diagnosed with cancer. More than 7 million are considered cured. Cancer is the most curable of all chronic diseases. An adjacent road to recovery includes bronze plaques with advice for people undergoing treatment. A survivor, Marcia Smith, said, cancer is not a death sentence, but rather it's a life sentence. It pushes one to live. So before I introduce our keynote speaker tonight, I'd like to share with you a clip from a recent segment on CNN's TV Tackles Cancer. Let's take a look. TV's disease. It's very advanced. Lung cancer. I just noticed that lung. What? Cancers come out of the closet, making itself comfortable in pop culture. We no longer say the word cancer in a hushed tone. And raising its profile big time in Hollywood. Supercharged by big stars going public 
with their battles and giving cancer a glamorous face. Nurse Jackie Ziti Falco had it in real life, and even Dr. Oz got a scare he shared on his show. And I just saw that polyp, and did, did not knowing, especially over that weekend, what it was going to be. It, just, it shakes you up. In fact, flip through the TV channels and try not to find somebody famous playing someone with cancer, talking about it, or living through it in their own real life. I think I was very fortunate to have the diagnosis come right towards the end of the uh, fourth season. So I was able to just get all my ducks in a row and start the treatment when we ended. Dexter's Michael C. Hall beat back Hodgkin's lymphoma this year, and Maura Tierney will return to TV in a new show, The Whole Truth, after breaking from Rescue Me for breast cancer treatment. I don't think there's anyone we know who hasn't been afflicted by it, who hasn't felt this hit their family in some way, their friends. Brian Cranston just plays a terminal cancer patient who resorts to drug dealing to support his family in Breaking Bad. The irreverent tone was nearly too much for TV two years ago as it premiered, recalls his co-star. When this show was about to air, we got a lot of flack. But today, the brand new show, The Big C, starring Laura Linney, can make cancer a comedy? She's diagnosed with stage four melanoma. Fifteen years ago, there was a lot of stigma around cancer. People did not talk about it the way it's talked about today. The fact that we are seeing more cancer-themed storylines on scripted shows as diverse as Mad Men and Army Wives is by design, according to the director of a program called Hollywood Health and Society, based at the University of Southern California. We have seen overall an increase in health storylines on television. We have a TV monitoring project. And we know that we're also seeing an increase in cancer storylines. They've been partnering with Hollywood producers and writers on health-related scripts for the past eight years. The reason this is important is we know that two-thirds of regular viewers of television report learning something new about a disease or how to prevent it from TV shows. And even Gene Simmons' rocker family might have taught us something when they were dealt a shocking cancer blow this season on their A&E reality show. Hey, Dado. Listen, uh, Mom's got a biopsy. I'm thinking that it might be serious. I'm going to have to leave the tour. They did a good job. Well, since film and television are powerful forces for social change, we're here tonight to consider the role of TV cancer storylines. And as writers, you have the opportunity, first and foremost, to entertain. But you can also inspire and teach viewers about preventing, treating, and overcoming cancer. So to speak with us about the facts about cancer, I'd like to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Richardson. Dr. Richardson is the Associate Director of Science and CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. There she oversees the research and scientific content of the programs. Her division administers the only organized breast and cervical cancer screening program for low-income, uninsured women. The division also administers the National Program of Cancer Registries, which, in collaboration with the National Cancer Institute program, covers 99% of the U.S. population for cancer incidence. Her research focuses on access to cancer care, systems of care, health-related quali quality of life during cancer treatment, health disparities, and racial discrimination, and breast cancer treatment patterns of care. Dr. Richardson graduated in medicine from the University of North Carolina and completed her internship, residency, and fellowship training at the University of Florida. She's board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology and continues to see case, uh, cancer patients at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Richardson. Thank you. I um, didn't realize my head was back there. <laughs> That's pretty scary. <laughs> In any case, I think Sandra pretty much um, has stolen my thunder, so I don't know where to go. I think, well, I mean, the, the title of the talk is Telling Compelling Stories About Cancer. And I think the three, I got to watch more TV, by the way, the three minute clip that you just showed pretty much wraps it up as to, you know, what it is that we're supposed to be interested in why we're here. Um, I think we all, as you said, cancer is compelling and we all know someone with cancer and, you know, within your lifetime, 
um, a child born today, one in two boys and one in three girls will develop cancer at some point in their life. Um, which is, you know, everybody, as Sandra said, everybody knows someone with cancer. And if you don't, you know, you will, I'm sure, fairly soon. Um, there's about one and a half million cancer patients diagnosed in this country a year. Um, and about 12 million survivors now at the last count, the data that was, you know, was, came out last year. And it's like a million people have lived longer than 25 years with cancer or after a diagnosis. And um, it struck me what you said is very interesting. It is a curable disease because when, you know, when I think about cancer as a cancer doctor taking care of people, um, there is an opportunity to cure people, but you don't cure high blood pressure. You treat it, you manage it. You don't cure diabetes. You treat it, you manage it. But you can cure cancer. And that's sort of one of those, you know, I had, you know, I think about this stuff all the time, but it really is one of those things where we can say that we cure people. Um, keeping in mind, and there are one or two, I think one or two survivors in the room who are going to speak, um, that survivors do have to deal with the side effects of those treatments, which lead to a whole nother set of problems. Um, and the CDC is really um, working um, very hard to, with a national action plan for cancer survivors, working with Lance Armstrong and other groups um, to address the needs of cancer survivors. So, um, as I said, I think, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. That's one of my sayings too, by the way, it's all good. And I am very, very, very pleased to be here speaking with you all. And the best part of the um, program, in my mind, is the question and answer session because um, that's usually where we get uh, the most information, not from prepared remarks from someone like myself. Um, but anyway, speaking about, you know, being a doctor who takes care of cancer patients, this is probably, there we go. Um, in my mind, cancer is sort of a um, two-sided coin. Um, so to speak. There's the glamorous side of all these new therapies. It's wonderful. We're curing people. Um, but in my, as a public health person, the real goal is for people never to get cancer at all. And that is the non-glamorous part of cancer prevention, where we're trying to make sure that people know that they need, should eat right, protect themselves from the sun, um, exercise, don't smoke, those types of things. And that isn't very glamorous. And uh, one of the comments that has been made to me in the past is you don't really believe you're going to get people to change their behaviors, do you? <laughs> well, of course I do. I mean, I <laughs> wouldn't do it otherwise. But I think, you know, in my mind, it's one person at a time, one um, encounter at a time. And if, you know, in my mind, as a resident and fellow, uh, training to be a cancer doctor, if, you, if I could get one person to stop smoking, that's a success. I don't have to get a million to stop smoking, but that is the ultimate goal is to get us all, you know, on the page where we're not smoking. Um, in particular, CDC's Office of Smoking and Health is launching a campaign tomorrow, actually, on looking at um, depicting and you guys have a really cool ad here in L.A. of a woman, well, I shouldn't say cool, sorry about that, the, the way that it's put together is that this campaign at CDC is doing the same thing that was done here in Los Angeles County. It's using a real person who's been affected by tobacco. So the one I saw today on KABC was a woman who had had a stroke and her husband was caring for her. Um, she was 100% total care and she was probably in her mid-50s and the other thing we don't realize is that if you're a smoker, you get those conditions usually 10 to 15 years earlier than you would have otherwise. So you would have a stroke at 50 instead of 65 or 70. Um, you'd have a heart attack at 55 rather than 65 or 70. So the impact is quite, you know, and if you're a younger person, that means you have children. You know, you really have a lot of reasons not to do that or not to continue um, with those behaviors. Um, we at CDC, Sandra asked me to talk about cancer registries, <laughs> which is very dry. Um, but anyway, the, um, we have a report coming out at the end of this month about obesity and cancer. 
Um, and I think, you know, I would say most people don't know that there's a link between being overweight and developing cancer. So the real interesting thing, the reports coming out at the end of March, the real interesting thing in there is that the overall cancer rates are coming down, but those related to obesity are actually still increasing. Um, and some of them are increasing quite, quite rapidly. Kidney cancer, esophageal cancer, pancreatic. Um, so there is work to be done there as well. Um, to maintain a normal weight, um, and it's really, you know, we've switched our, you know, focus to stop hammering people about, you know, becoming thin, but, you know, to maintain a weight, try to, you know, lose 5 to 10 percent, not, you know, massive amounts of weight, and, um, you know, I'll confess that that's one of my constant struggles is the, the 10 to 15 up and down. I probably lost that about 50 times in my lifetime. Um, as I said earlier, or I'll, you know, you know, comment on that a little bit more, about a third of children and adolescents are currently overweight in the United States of America. That's just unbelievable. Um, and two-thirds of adults are. So, you know, there are, it's, which means those cancers related to that will most likely continue to increase. And so that, that to me, is a place that we can go. Um, but how do you make those messages sexy? How do you make them resonate with people how do you you know i know what i'm supposed to eat and i still struggle you know with doing it every day or doing it right every day or doing the best i can i should say our division as sandra said is also a leader in cancer screening um timely strength you know testing for breast colorectal and cervical cancer will lower your chance of dying from these cancers and half of the improvement that we've seen over the last two to three decades is strictly from screening um, you know, therapy is, is, works as well and gets you the other 50%, but screening and treating what you find um, has really made inroads in those areas. I think public health has made significant contributions to increasing the number of survivors, um, which is a wonderful accomplishment, uh, but now we must switch to the discussion of how do we prevent them from happening in the first place, which as I said earlier is the real cure. You know, at the VA when I go there, you know, they'll ask me, have you found the cure for cancer, doc? And so then I say, well, you know, you're still doing that. Yes, we have, you know, but it's a personal responsibility issue. And also from our end too, um, one of the things I dislike, you know, about a lot of the things out there about the message around smoking is that, you know, cigarettes are an addiction just like every other addiction, and we have to raise it to the level of not just being a nasty habit, but being something that people really do need help, sometimes medications, counseling, um, and that's another place where, you know, we could get some help with that as well. It's not just about willpower. We could have all the willpower in the world, and then, you know, we walk past a guy having a cigarette and we'll ask for one. So um, that's something else we have to keep in mind, to stop blaming the victim, um, which um, occasionally happens. Presenting information in a way that resonates with the public is critical to our mission of preventing cancer, and we believe we can achieve this goal by working in partnership with Hollywood Health and Society and the writers, and we'll be more than happy to help you um, tell a compelling story or help us to tell one as well. Um, and anything we could do to help you, we're you know, more than happy to do that, and vice, and vice versa, I hope. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to introduce our panelists, and I'm very pleased to introduce Darlene Hunt, a creator and executive producer of the critically acclaimed and award-winning hit series on Showtime, The Big C. Darlene is also an actor and a writer. Originally from Louisville, Hunt studied theater at Northwestern University, the Royal National Theater in London, and the British American Drama Academy in Oxford. She starred with actor Sean Hayes in Platonically Incorrect, a play that she also wrote. It was staged in Los Angeles and New York and was later developed into a pilot by ABC. After writing nine more pilots for various networks, her series The Big C, starring Laura Linney, debuted on Showtime in August of 2010 to much acclaim. And it returns for its third season starting on April 8th this year. Hunt has previously co-starred with Ted Danson on ABC's Help Me Help You. <laughs> and on the big screen, she has played opposite Jude Law and Lily Tomlin in David O. Russell's film, I Heart Huckabees. 
She has many other film and TV credits and has also appeared in numerous commercials. So welcome, Darlene. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vijay Trisal, surgical oncologist from City of Hope Hospital. Dr. Trisal has a special interest in all cancers, most specifically breast and GI cancers. His research is based on melanoma and sarcomas, which are cancer of the connective tissue. Dr. Trisal is involved in multiple clinical trials and heads the tumor board. I'm not sure that's something I'd want to um, head, but the tumor board in, in sarcoma to discuss and plan treatment of challenging rare tumors. After receiving his medical degree from uh, the University of Kashmir in India, Dr. Trisal studied immunology at Wayne State University in Michigan. He completed his general surgical residency at Michigan's Providence Hospital and went on to join the prestigious fellowship in surgical oncology at the City of Hope National Medical Center. His interest in melanoma and sarcoma led his research team in the pursuit of markers and genetic changes in melanoma. And it was part of his work that led to the discovery of the new genes that are implicated in melanoma progression and can be targeted in treatment. So Dr. Trisal has won numerous awards for his work. So welcome. Next, I'm very glad to introduce Jessica Queller. Jessica is a television writer and producer whose cre credits include Gossip Girl, Gilmore Girls, and Felicity. In 2004, Jessica wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times about inheriting the BRCA gene mutation from her mother. Jessica followed the article with a memoir on the same subject called Pretty is What Changes, and it's a beautiful book and there are a few copies on the table if they're not already gone, so I recommend it to everyone. Jessica has appeared extensively on television and radio, speaking of her personal experience as a carrier of the BRCA mutation. Appearances include Nightline, Good Morning America, Tavis Smiley, NPR Morning Edition, and others. And Jessica also regularly speaks to groups around the country on the topic of cancer prevention, and we're so glad to have you with us today. And last, but definitely not least, I'm pleased to introduce Patty Carr. Patty is the co-executive producer and showrunner of the CW's hit show, 90210. She went to high school in St. Louis with her fellow co-executive producer of 90210, Lara Olson. And after reconnecting in LA, Carr and Olson worked for several years in half-hour comedy, including five years on the show Reba. They then made the switch to hour-long television when they shot a pilot for CBS, a remake of the British one-hour romantic comedy, Nylon. And I had to get help in pronouncing that correctly because it looked like New York, London to me, but it's <laughs> Nylon, N-Y-L-O-N. Uh, prior to 90210, Carr and Olson were co-executive producers on Till Death and Private Practice. Most recently, they served as co-executive producers of the critically acclaimed CW drama, Life Unexpected. So we're so glad to have you here. Welcome. So tonight, we're going to hear from our panelists, and then we'll have some questions and answers from the audience. And we're going to start by hearing from Darlene Hunt, creator and executive producer of The Big C, and we're going to start by watching a clip of her show. So let's take a look. And I could do chemo, but I'd just be buying a little more time and it would mean a lot of people taking care of me and it's just not my thing. You know what makes me feel better though, if I'm being honest? It makes me feel better to think that we're all dying. All of us. And when you have a kid, you expect that you'll die before they do. I mean, you, even though you try not to think about it, at least you hope to God you do. So 
So if I think about it that way, hey, I'm living the dream. I'm here all year, performing at stage four. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on, you gotta give it up for me a little bit. It's kind of funny. Death comedy. <laughs> I'm warning you that this laughter might turn into a sob in a second. Yeah. There it goes. <laughs> as long as I'm being raw and vulnerable here, I might as well tell you I'm feeling very much in love with you right now. It could just be gratitude. You want to see my boobs? No one else seems to give a shit. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine, yeah This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine um, A little tidbit, um, <laughs> that dog died two weeks after we shot that scene of Dog heart cancer. <gasps> oh, the irony. The cruel, cruel irony. But death comes to us all, doesn't it? Um, now I'm so paranoid having so many experts in the room. I was like, I'm like, what does Dr. Trissol think of that x ray? Is that the right? <laughs> did we use an appropriate x ray? Does that give her enough time? Good <laughs> um, You know, it, it's. Um, Dr. Chazal has been one of our um, the people that we call and get it, and I've never met you in person, so I didn't realize until she introduced you that that was you. So it's such a pleasure to uh, to be sitting up here with you, and yeah, and thank you so much because um, uh, I'll tell you, talk a little bit in a moment, but uh, but we sort of have several experts on call via email or. Um, or people that we call and arrange um, sort of conference call with our writers room with, or people we've had come in uh, to talk to us to um, to give us information uh, and medical accuracy, so then we can kind of go and tell our stories and and try to be as accurate as possible. Um, I, I want to back up just a little bit and and um, just talk about how I came up with the idea of the show and and how we got on the air. Um, seems to be the questions that that I get a lot. Um, uh, from people interested in the show. Um, one question I always get is, did I come up with this idea because I'm a cancer survivor? Um, the answer is no, uh, luckily. Um, the fact is, I came to it more from the point of view of a writer and, and from my art and, and what I wanted to see on TV. And I'd already, always sort of struggled with my personal tone as a writer, because um, I like sort of laughter through tears comedy. Um, I consider myself a comedian. I only write comedy, uh, and yet it always has to be hinged in something kind of real and dark, because I'm a little bit of a glass half empty, we're all dying kind of person. Um, so if there's too much fluff, it just doesn't work for me, uh, which I think is the reason I had written nine or ten pilots without getting one picked up, because I'd struggled with the tone. I, occasionally I was like, uh, would get from the networks. Uh, could it be a little funnier? I'm like, but it's so real. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I was really anxious to write. A, I always try to create characters that people can relate to, that I can relate to. Um, and I, I had a meeting uh, as I was about to start a new TV development season. I sat down with a producer named Vivian Cannon. We started talking about shows that we would love to see on the air, but we didn't think anyone would ever actually buy and put on the air. And she said, I think it's time for a cancer comedy. And I immediately perked up um, because I thought, because I thought uh, that's a tone I can, I can write to. I can write to um, uh, 
I, I, I was just so excited that I had found kind of a like mind, somebody that would put something dark uh, with the word comedy. And, um, and so I wanted, I wanted to pursue that. That being said, my agent, my manager, they were like, you know what, you don't actually have to work with Vivian. Why don't you meet some other people? Talk about some other ideas. But I was like, oh, I was like, there's something there. I, I really, God, wouldn't it be incredible if you could write, if I could get a character on TV who was dealing with something that we have all dealt with in some way. Again, not as a survivor, but as someone who, who knows survivors. Um, and so, you know, I let it marinate, but I told Vivian, I, I, um, if I were a cancer survivor, um, I would, I would be able to write one version of the show. I could see it in my head. I could see somebody going through cancer treatment with humor, with the crazy signs that you see when you go to get a treatment done and with the interactions you have with people in the waiting room. Like, I could see that show, but I couldn't write it because I just, I don't have that information at my fingertips. I don't know what those signs are. I haven't been to those rooms. I haven't gone through chemo. Um, so I said, if I can find a way in, I'll, I'll circle back with you. That being said, I just had my first baby and had a moment uh, at home where my husband came home and I was just holding our baby and sobbing. And he was like, oh my God, do you wish, do you, wish you hadn't had her? I was like, no, that's not why I'm crying. Although I've had those moments. <laughs> but uh, when you get sent home and you're like, can the doctor come with me? Um, but I was crying because I just had this overwhelming sense of like, oh my God, I just want to take care of her for the rest of her life and be with her forever. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do that. Because God willing, if everything works out great, I'm going to be fucking dead before she is. <laughs> and I was so traumatized by the first time in my life realizing that I was going to die that I was like, oh, what is the point? And and I gotta change it up. I gotta start embracing the moment. I gotta live in the here and now. I start. I gotta start having more fun. I gotta stop thinking about the future so much. And so that's when I circled back with Vivian. I said I can write a show about a woman um, with cancer who who decides to change up her life and realize the way she's been living it is not the way she wants to live it. Um, so that sort of. Um, I, as far as the tone of our show, as far as the point of view of the show, that kind of remains the same. It's about a woman who's, who's, who's living her life, and it's more about her emotional reaction and the things going on in her life. Uh, and we try to keep the cancer in the background. Um, I did all of my research for the pilot through Facebook. I got in touch with, uh, with a doctor friend I had gone to school with. And, uh, and you know, we spent a lot of time back and forth where I was asking about di different types of cancers and how they presented and this and that. And for a while, she, the character had lymphoma, and then I learned more, and I was like, yikes, not that. Um, you know, because it, it does become this weird thing where you're looking for some reality to fit with what your dramatic needs are. Um, and so you're kind of hoping, you're like, oh, can you treat it with this? Oh, shoot, that ruins my story and whatever. So um, I landed on, on melanoma. And the truth is I wanted something dire. I wanted something that meant when she, that, that would buy her the response, I'm not even going to do chemo because my doctors say it'll only buy you a little time. It's not a cure. Um, because I wanted to tell the story of a woman uh, marching toward her death because that is what we are doing. Um, that, again, I'm probably more pessimistic than a cancer <laughs> survivor would be because we get a lot of comments from cancer survivors who are like, don't let her die. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you, I'm glad you're there. Um, so I, I appreciate that perspective, but I do maintain that I'm, we're trying to tell the sto story, a bigger picture story about the reality of us all. Mm -hmm. um, that also being said, um, as much as I kind of wanted that to be the story, once we started the room and I started learning more about melanoma and cancer, I realized like, holy shit, they're coming up for with treatments for melanoma all the time. And literally from the time I wrote the pilot to the time we were airing, 
Like, there were more treatments for melanoma. It wasn't as dire. It's maybe, it's not quite as, like, chemo is it maybe the best, the most effective thing or certain, now, now I'm getting very nervous looking at Dr. Tassau. <laughs> um, but that being said, there, there, are, there are more and more treatments for it. And then we had to honor that in the writing. And that's why in the finale of the first season, she decides to undergo uh, interleukin, which is a very risky treatment. But, uh, but I couldn't turn a blind eye to the reality of, of um, the treatments for that particular t disease. And, uh, and we continue to revisit that uh, with each season uh, to look, look at the truth of cancer and melanoma, and then how to to use it in our show and to tell the stories we want to tell. Mm -hmm. So, Darlene, it's just amazing. I, I love your show, and I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been anything um, <coughs> that you've wanted to say in the show? You wanted to talk about that you've been told you can't. Is there is there an edge? that you can't go beyond. You were talking about this balance of sort of dark and, and then comedy. So was there anything in that dark realm that you weren't allowed to address? Mm. I'm glancing at our, one of our writers is here, Hilly. I'm trying to think, hmm. Uh, to be honest with you, part, partly because, um, you know, a, a, when, when I went out with the pitch, ABC was actually, actually wanted to buy the idea, and Showtime did as well. Um, but I felt like if I did it at ABC, I was going to reach a point where they said, can she not have cancer? Mm. Um, so I was just kind of, as much as I wanted to reach a wider audience, I got so nervous about doing that there. And, and Showtime has really, um, uh, really, I mean, li they like the dark. To be honest with you, in the pilot, mm -hmm. I originally, she didn't have a kid. She was childless because I thought, oh, well, that's too dark. And then after I wrote the first uh, draft of the pilot, the only note I got was they called me in. I was like, they're going to pick it up. They're going to shower me with compliments. And they were like, we really like it, but we want it to be complicated. Life is complicated, and we think she should have a son. And um, so I had to find my way in, into that. Um, but I, to answer your question specifically, the only thing I can think of is we – we came up with this story first season that we all loved, and the writer did such a lovely job. There's so many steps you go through. She did the story paragraph for it. Um, and, you know, it was, um, it, it involved, I think, Kathy, like, picking out a, a casket. I just remember there was a scene in a graveyard at, at one point, and we just thought it was, like, the most eloquent, cool thing. And, um, and the president of Showtime at the time freaked out, and he was like, Ooh. He's like, she's supposed to be having fun this season and, and living life with wild abandon. And so we we're like, oh, okay. Uh, we actually thought it was kind of funny at moments. Um, and truthful, because people got to pick out their coffins. Uh, we, we ended up doing that episode similar to that, something similar in, in season two. But yeah, season one was apparently too early. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to hear from Dr. Trisal. Um I'm just going to talk about a few snippets, and I'm not sure how there how people view medical shows on on TV. But I can tell you that when, as a medical professional, majority of people when they view t shows on TV, there's a lot of skepticism. You know, they come in with this thought that this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen this way. The drama is different, and. I want to challenge myself and everybody here to say what is a compelling story? Mm -hmm. What do you call a compelling story? Something that has all drama and no fact to it. And when you look at these shows, you have a half an hour show and after half an hour, you switch your mind off. And that is the one side of the drama. Mm -hmm. I can give you a couple of um, events that happened very recently. This is not, I'm not picking up from uh, my whole history which is quite long, but I can tell you that these dramas are much more dramatic in real life than what we make them out to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, let me give you a couple of examples, and then I'll come back to this story of what a compelling story is. So uh, very recently I saw a young lady who had um, renal failure, and her mom had um, given her kidney to the daughter. The daughter had uh, developed renal failure because of a very unusual type of nephrotic syndrome, which happens when you get a bad infection 
there's a cross reaction between the kidney and these bacteria and the kidneys fail. So the mom gave the kidney to the daughter and after three years the mother comes with a lump in the, um, in the lung and we biopsied it, it's a type of tumor called sarcoma. So we're trying to find, typically sarcomas don't happen in the lung and we're trying to find where the primary came from. So we get through all these PET scans and uh, MRIs and CAT scans and blood tests, and we can't find a primary. And occasionally it might happen that the primary the body has taken care of and the metastatic disease that has gone to the lung is stayed there. But the genetics of this disease didn't fit well, so we treated it like a sarcoma. We resected it and treated it. And four months later, the daughter comes back with a tumor in the kidney that was donated to her mom. Oh. So the kidney started the tumor, which was donated to the daughter. And I, I can't think of more dramatic wow. scenarios mm -hmm. that I can conjure up and say, OK, that this is drama, and it doesn't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. It happens. But uh, so let me give you another example. Metastatic melanoma, which is a disease. Mm -hmm. I call it a wildfire. Right. It's a wildfire, and we have been chasing it for the past 30 years because of a couple of things that happened. So what happened is that uh, a guy named Steve Rosenberg, who is one of my uh, you know, um, leaders and gurus, uh, he is a, he's a world-renowned figure in metastatic melanoma, he saw that patients who had metastatic melanoma, so now we have worldly metastatic disease in the brain, in the body, everywhere, and you get something bizarre. You get poison ivy, or you get a bee sting, or you get a bad cold, and the whole disease is gone. I mean, within 10 days, this patient who has a median survival of three months now is cured. And what happens in the body? And that is what has driven us through this targeted therapy, um, you, know, you know, this cascade of targeted therapy. What happens is the body's immune system suddenly gets upregulated. And it finds the target in these cancer cells. It manufactures this target, like the iRobot and kills all the cells, which we could never. We, we as surgeons are crude in treating cancer. We as surgeons think that the scalpel, which is like you know, having an argument with somebody civil, you're picking up a bazooka gun and started firing like that. And that is how we as surgeons treat cancers. So these are the dramas that can fit into the picture. But the other side of this, which I think we lack, is what probably the Big C has tried to touch somewhere. And I used to be a big critic till I got involved with one of them. Now I can't, I can't <laughs> criticize <laughs> anything. So the other aspect is this aspect that is a humdrum. It is, it is a daily grind. And I think that is the aspect we don't see as much. You know, the, the Lance Armstrong drama mm -hmm. is a different cancer. Yeah. It is a different cancer that has a cure rate. So putting the onus on patients that you have to fight it, and you're not fighting it hard enough, because their disease is a pancreatic cancer, which can't be fought hard enough, which is a different disease than um, a lymphoma, which is a much more curable disease. And having the drama of talking to a patient for two hours, trying to explain the disease process, trying to explain um, the, the hard facts, trying to get through hospice, is is not the glamorous part. But I don't think, I think you guys have done a dramatic job in trying to put the emotion as the, as the glamour in there, trying to find ways to portray that. And majority of my patients come in, their information is not true information. Mm -hmm. uh, here in LA, I see, I see a different population. So I work at City of Hope, which is my mother hospital. Then I also go to Lancaster, which is one of our outpost where I provide a lot of different cancer care. And the education that comes to a lot of the patients in LA is different than what comes in, in Lancaster. I mean, you don't have to go all the way to Bombay. Right. You can go to Lancaster <laughs> and find a lot of those stories um, and be able to connect with them. And a lot of the information does come from TV. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the treatments uh, that, uh, that Dalim was talking about, about the targeted therapies, have been so over-dramatized that we, on, on one hand, spend a lot of time trying to erase some of that information before starting the real information going forth. Um, so the new drugs like the Zalbaraf or the 
um, epilumumab, these are targeted therapies. So this is the other drama. You can actually make a cartoon uh, drama of cancer without having humans in it where, and this is actually true, you have these targeted cells, and the cell, the cancer cell, has these amazing uh, antennas on top, which we're trying to target. We don't know which ones are the critical antennas, which ones are not the critical antennas. And we target all of them. And the cancer cell is so smart, they say, mm -hmm. and no offense to medical oncologists, they say a dumb cancer cell is smarter than the smartest medical oncologist. No doubt. Uh, because uh, <laughs> they, they change their covers, they change their targets so frequently mm -hmm. that by the time you have formed out, uh, yeah. a, a target towards one antenna, the antenna has changed. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens with the AIDS virus right. or other, mm -hmm. other viruses that escape us. The story of Zelbaraf and the story of Ipilumumab gets pasted on the front page as it should be. But when it comes down to patients, the survival is minimal. Right. So the advances we used to make in five years, um, say 10 years back, I, I was doing my graduate studies, we would do PCRs, which were tests to look at certain genes. Mm -hmm. It would take us three months to do one PCR. Today, I can basically mm -hmm. put the <coughs> test tube into the PCR machine, go grab a coffee, and by the time I come back, it has done 500 PCRs. Mm -hmm. So in this barrage of information for these cancer cells, we sometimes get lost in the sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, these targeted therapies, like the uh, targeted therapies for new disease like sarcomas, have been amazing. They have changed the survival from one end to another but majority of them fizzle out. Majority of them don't come to clinical trials where they have an impact. And I think, rolling back to the compelling story. So what becomes a compelling story? Where do we interact drama, which is real, mm -hmm. that will have both a business aspect to it, where you can attract um, a group of patient population, not just the ones who have melanoma, who feel like, no, this is my story, I want to watch this, but have the emotional aspect of it in there. And where do you take the social aspect of it? And I, I, I think that is where uh, there somewhere is a disconnect. And how we bridge that, I, I'm not sure. And whether we should bridge that, whether, whether TV should be entertainment or TV should be education. Um, this country is probably the best place. And I've, I've traveled through different countries. I'll tell you, I uh, met this actress in India and I asked her, what was in this what was in this story what what did you want to convey she said if you want to learn something go read a book don't watch a movie <laughs> this is not the way to get information but this country i think we have many a times tried to form a congruent thought process between yes we want to convey something real and the reason i think i am partly here is because most of you want to convey somewhere you don't want to convey falsehood uh, you, mm -hmm. you do want to make it, it attractive, but at the same time, you don't want to have false uh, information out there. And I'm very excited to be part of all of this. Thank you for inviting mm -hmm. me. Thank you, Dr. Trisal. That was really interesting. And I want to pick up on one point you made, uh, maybe you just alluded to, which are the health disparities, the social determinants. And maybe could you just elaborate a little bit on, you know, the disparities you see in your patients, the cancer patients. Is this determined by zip code? What determines those disparities? So the two big things that I see that, that are becoming problematic, one is where the insurance decides where you go. Mm -hmm. And you will have patients who are living next to this amazing cancer center that has um, the best doctors close by, but the medical group is not contracted with this, and they bypass and go to a place where somebody who uh, is, a, is a decent doctor but does not have the focus on complicated stuff. So 90% of cancers, for example, um, can, we can make them generic, okay? So this is, this is the regular treatment, this is the algorithm, this is the disease, this is the pathology. But probably out of those 90, 40 will um, basically, they will select out to be something complicated and need a much more focus. So mm -hmm. let's talk about malignant melanoma. Yes, the standard of care is um, high dose IL-2 or interferon, which has minimal benefit, which is quite toxic. But mm -hmm. when you pass that, when you have, have disease that is 
uh, you know, slow growing, lingering, which is what happens sometimes. It's the same wildfire phenomena. You have this simmering disease for 10 years and suddenly the wildfire takes over and then it's days before everything comes over. So that group of patients, they need people who have an expertise in this disease. So insurance, uh, not trying to, uh, you know, beat around the bush. So insurance is one factor that prevents care from being delivered in the right instance. The other is education. You know, uh, I see patients in the City of Hope, they've already had three opinions. They know the data probably sometimes better than me, and mm -hmm. I, I just <laughs> nod because uh, <laughs> some of that is so, is so trick that you don't need to know that. But when I go to Lancaster, they don't even know. They say, Doc, why are you telling me all this? What, you tell me what to do, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. But getting them to the right place, the, the traffic, the, uh, the focus on physicians, from physicians who are mainly focused on uh, you know, like a, it, it's an assembly line. And cancer care mm -hmm. cannot be an assembly line. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I have patients who sometimes are waiting in my clinic for two hours, because if I have a discussion with a family and it takes two hours, you can't rush that discussion. And you rush that discussion, you will never be able to connect and be able to provide care at that time. So a lot of the problems are that cancer care is a specialized care that needs um, a different approach, and that is the problem in the community, if we're just talking about cancer care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, now we're going to uh, turn the mic over to Jessica Queller to hear her story. Jessica. Thank you so much. I'm truly honored to be here, and um, it's round coming full circle for me being on this side of the table. <laughs> um, I'll get to that in a few minutes, but I I was first introduced to this organization sitting out there about eight years ago. Um, I think on this panel, I, I bridge um, the TV writers and the medical experts. I'm in a weird situation. I, I'm pretty much here to share my personal medical story with you, but I happen to be a TV writer who's written on staff for 11 years, so I think for this audience, I will contextualize my personal story based on the shows I was writing for when things happened to me, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, my story begins in, this story begins in 2001. I was a staff writer on Felicity, and um, it was right after 9-11. My mother was diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer. Um, I'm from New York City, and my mom was in New York, and I was living out here writing on Felicity, and my whole family, we were completely shocked and devastated. My mom was 58, and a very young 58, beautiful, glamorous fashion designer. I always joke that um, my mom was wearing Manolo's when Sarah Jessica Parker was still in diapers, and <laughs> that's a fact. Um, she was healthy, athletic. She ran six miles a day by the Hudson River. She was a careful eater. I mean, she was, she had rollerblades. I mean, she was the portrait of health and a young mom. And um, Prior to her ovarian cancer diagnosis, she had been blindsided with breast cancer at the age of 52, which she beat. So um, we were all, I was quite young when she had breast cancer, and we were shocked and, and terrified, but she, she beat it, and um, I guess it was seven or eight years later, she was diagnosed with a second primary cancer, ovarian cancer. And we thought at the time, what horrible luck. I mean, what are the chances of having two separate primary cancers, completely unrelated, so we thought. Um, so I moved back to New York. I then got a writing job on Ed, a show called Ed. Mm -hmm. And I, my mother moved in, we moved in together while she was basically fighting for her life. She was told she had five years to live and in fact, she had un less than two. So the year is now 2002, I guess. And um, my sister and I were there in New York. We went with my mother to every chemotherapy treatment every week. We w slept in, on cots in the hospital room with her for every surgery. And there were 
limitless surgeries. And when I was listening to you speak, Darlene, I was sitting there saying, God, I'm so much darker than you are <laughs> because I've been in those rooms and I've lived those rooms and I, I have a lot of dark humor about it, but I have the, the dark um, texture in me of, of those years, which were pure horror, uh, completely unimaginable. And also, my mom, when she was high on morphine, uh, uh, arranged her own funeral and the flowers she wanted, everything you're talking about, I lived with her. Um, so anyway, my mom passed away when I was 33 in 2003. And um, a point I wanted to make is that my mom was being treated at NYU Hospital one of the best hospitals in the country. And something called the BRCA mutation, the BRCA gene, um, the test for the BRCA gene had been in existence for seven or eight years when my mother was being treated at NYU. Not a single doctor mentioned it to my mother, to me, to my sister, nobody. Because everyone was so myopic, every specialist was looking at their tiny part of the picture that nobody ever mentioned to us that there actually was a genetic connection between having two primary cancers, one breast and one ovarian. It never came up. In my mother's lifetime, she never knew anything about this gene. A year after my mother died, well, let me, I, I forgot a big part of the story. The way I found out about this test is my best friend from high school happened to be on um, a charity committee, a, a, a center called the Lynn Cohen Center, um, and it was for preventive women's cancers. So my best friend from high school, who I'd known since I was 12, said, you know, I'm, I'm raising money for this foundation and there's this cutting edge blood test about inherited breast and ovarian cancer, and I think because your mom has had both that you're a candidate for this blood test. She told me this when my mom had just been diagnosed, and I said, you know, wow, that's really interesting, but I'm 31, I'm really not worried about myself, I have to help my mom survive. And I stored it in the back of my mind. I, I mean, it was so incidental, I never even brought it up to any of my mother's doctors, but it was there and I never forgot it. A year after my mother died, I'm now 34 years old, ready to begin my life again. I move back to LA and I get a job on the Gilmore Girls. Um, I'm ready to, you know, fall in love. I, obviously my 30s were dominated by cancer and illness and death and mourning. And um, I, though I'd managed to somehow keep my write, TV writing career alive, I had not managed to keep my personal life going at all. So now I thought, well, okay, I'm 34, I'll fall in love, I need to have a family, it's time for me to return to life again. And what about all those things I've been neglecting? I forgot, I haven't had my teeth cleaned in three years, my driver's license is expired, uh, you know, I need a checkup. Oh, and I should get that blood test, that blood test I had in the back of my mind. I was so certain that I would test negative because there was no history of cancer in our family except for my mother. My, her mother, my mother had no siblings, but her mother and her mother's mother, there had been no cancer at all. So I thought, I'm going to take this test like one takes an AIDS test every 10 years. Many of us take an HIV test. Like I'm pretty sure because of the, my lifestyle that I don't have HIV, but I want that clean bill of health. Why not? I was so arrogant and cavalier that I would test negative that I didn't even go through the counseling that I knew I should, the requisite counseling. I called my cousin who was a doctor in LA and said, I have to write for Lorelei and Rory. I have pitch meetings. I don't have time to go through counseling. Just get me an appointment at a blood lab and I, I, just, I just want the clean bill of health. So I cut the corners knowingly and I never heard back from the m months went by and I, it started to bo bother me, so I called the lab and I said, I need to know those results, why haven't I heard from you? And the, the receptionist said, well, the envelope's here, but only the doctor's allowed to give you the results. And ultimately, I got the doctor on the phone, and it's a long story, but he had a terrible bedside manner, and he was all in a huff and said, who are you, and why did you take this test? And, and he told me over the phone that I tested positive, and I was so confused I didn't even know really what I was waiting for that in the moment I thought positive sounds like a, a positive word. So I said, well, wait a minute. 
positive, that's bad, right? You know, it took me a moment to mm. even realize what I was being told. And he said, yes, it's, it's very bad. And you will most likely get cancer in your life. And I don't know how to help you. You know, you need to find some counselor, but good luck. <laughs> no, but I've now been talking about this subject nationally and internationally for 10 years. Nobody has a story like this. It's my own fault. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I knew better than to cut corners and go to a lab. But, but that was my destiny. So then I got the results in the mail, and the statistics said I had up to a 90% chance of breast cancer, most likely before the age of 50. And at the time, the statistics said I had a 44% chance of ovarian cancer. Now the statistics have changed. It's actually 50% chance of ovarian cancer. Basically, good luck. Um, so what did I do? I put the results in a drawer, and I locked the drawer, and I blocked it out for the next six months. That said, I, I did tell my best friend from college that this is, I'm, I'm never gonna make one minute. Mm -hmm. I'll, try, I'll try to do about three. <laughs> um, I told my best friend from college that, um, about it, and she had an intervention, and said, I love you, and I don't want you to die. And I spoke to my friend who's a breast surgeon at Harvard, and you need to have your breast removed. And I said, fuck you, <laughs> basically, are you insane? I don't have cancer, I'm 34 years old, my mother just died, I wanna have a family, I wanna fall in love. You think I'm gonna have my breasts removed without cancer? You must be insane, back off. Um, that said, I was very upset. Um, and then she came back a week or two later and said, well, I, I have another proposal for you. She happened to be a, an op-ed editor for the New York Times, an assistant editor. She, How would you like to write an op-ed piece for the New York Times? I pitched the idea to my boss and he's interested. Well, of course, you say that to a writer and my writer antenna ambition goes up and says, me, write an op-ed piece for the New York Times? <laughs> of course, sign me up. I'll learn everything there is to know about it and I'll become an expert, let's go. So for this article, I became an expert on the BRCA mutation. And of course, what I learned was information that would save my life. And um, the more I researched for the article, and I did publish the article, the more I realized I was in big trouble. So um, here we come to Hollywood Health, Hollywood, Hollywood Health, Health and Society, Society. <laughs> HHNS. Um, I wrote this article for the op-ed page, and I still had not decided what I would do. I wrote the article basically posing the question, is knowledge power or is ignorance bliss? I don't know the answer. I don't know what I'm going to do, but um, I'm in a very, very bad situation. I went to doctors, and the doctors said, we don't know how to advise you. This is a case of science outpacing doctors' ability to know what to do with the data. Um, the gold standard is removing your breasts for preventing cancer, but what will that do to a young woman and your so socially and with your love life and your fertility and you know, we don't know what to tell you. So um, I had to become my own advocate and figure it out, but now I'm getting back to TV and culture. At that time, which now is six or seven years ago, no one had heard about the breast cancer gene. No one, it, the doctors at NYU had barely heard about it. No one in the society did. M my family thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy until I got an article published in the New York Times which sanctioned me as not crazy. Then people started to say, well, maybe she's not just an hysteric with post-traumatic stress syndrome because her mother died because nobody knew about it. So the idea of a young woman removing her breast to prevent cancer seemed insane. When I went, I, I did, uh, the article got a lot of attention because it was such a new subject and it became a book. And at the time I did an interview on Nightline and Cokie Roberts said to me, do people think that you are crazy? And I said, yes, <laughs> I think that they do. But having watched my mother die, the most horrific death imaginable, I know that this is the most sane decision that someone could make. Um, but yes, of course, I, I, they may not say it to my face, but I know that everybody thinks I'm crazy. Um, what happened next, so I had the surgery, and then I had a baby on my own, who's now two and a half, my daughter Sophie. 
And then I had my ovaries removed. So I did it all. So that brings us back to TV. Um, I had this very meta experience because I'd been writing in TV for quite a few years. I had friends on all these staffs. So as I was going through this, I know what it's like to rip stories from the headlines. That's what we do for a living. But suddenly I was the headline. I'd written this article in the Times and I had colleagues on all the shows who I'd worked with and one of my best friends was running ER at the time. And all of a sudden, as I'm going under the knife, he told me, by the way, I wrote a two-episode arc <laughs> about the BRCA gene, and we're going into production next week, and I want your blessings if you want to give me notes on the script. And I had this like, very confused emotional reaction of, you know, of course I was happy that the story was being told, but why didn't you ask me to write it? Like, are you, what? <laughs> this is being told, and I don't get to do it? Um, of course, I couldn't write it because I was about to have a mastectomy, um, but you know, once I, once I got over that and our friendship got over that, he did do a beautiful job. And then other colleagues I'd worked with wrote it at that same time on Grey's Anatomy. So I went from speaking on national television and Cokie Roberts asking, are you crazy? Because no one had heard of anything like this to a few months later, I would walk around and meet people and they're like, oh my God, I know all about this from Grey's Anatomy, or I saw this on ER, and that's how people knew what I was talking about. And you know, through my travels in, in the past seven years, when I, when I was grappling with this, no one had heard of um, prophylactic mastectomy, and now in 2012, there are, there's a, I, I, I'm the elder stateswoman. I went to speak to a group in Chicago of young girls called Be Bright Pink. They're all in their 20s. They've all taken the test. They're all doing pole dancing while talking about their breast reconstructions. And I think that <laughs> largely this is because the subject has entered the zeitgeist through television shows. And I know because I get emails once a week, sometimes several times a week from women saying that my book, the shows, the, the, the articles, that it, you know, being something that, that is accepted in society is, is making people do, take actions that will save their lives. Not just knowing about it, but having their parents know about it, their husbands know about it, so it doesn't sound like they're in hysteric and they're crazy. Um, so I know what kind of powerful tool television is. Anyway, I'm sorry I went over my allotted time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear from Patty Carr, and we're going to start with a clip of her show on, on 90210, her, of her storyline. I guess that means you're all grown up, mm -hmm. which means we should probably talk about your family medical history. Erin, your mom, your aunt, and your grandmother all died of breast cancer. And I know the drill, self-exams, regular checkups. And I'm going to start doing those. Good. You should also consider getting tested for the BRCA gene. If you have the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, your future includes an up to 60% chance of getting breast cancer. You'd have to consider preventative measures such as a prophylactic mastectomy. Do we have to talk about it now? We do. I've, I've had a pretty crappy year, and I finally have something to look forward to. So right now, I just want to get my life started. Yeah going to college, I probably won't be seeing you anymore, and by your early 20s, this could be a very urgent concern. It's my job to make sure you're informed about this. I just want to be excited about my future. And I just want you to have a healthy one. What's wrong? I might have a cancer gene, and I don't know if I want to take the test to find out. I might have to have surgery, and I might have to freeze my eggs if I want to have kids. And I haven't even told any of the girls any of this because I don't want them to worry about me. I don't want to die. And you're looking at me all weird. Sorry. No, uh, I... I mean, that. That sounds bad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, never mind. Look, I'm sorry that I, 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 I dropped all of this on you. Just please don't tell anybody, okay? What are you doing? What 
is this about a cancer test? Who told you? That doesn't matter. The question is, why didn't you? Because, Navid, it's no big deal. No big deal. Silver, you're, you're, you're being tested for the cancer gene. I can't believe you didn't tell me. Well, you weren't here to tell. What does that mean? It means you left, okay? Oh, so, so because I decided to go to school, everyone forgets how to use a cell phone. How are you making this about you? We're not even together anymore. We may not be together, but I still care about you. Well, look, Navi, this is something that I need to go through alone. But those test results don't just affect you. How could you be so selfish? Wow. See, I thought the selfish thing would have been to call you and ask you to come home, but I didn't do that because I didn't want to mess up your amazing new life. Now I get it. Forget it, okay? You're not gonna make me feel guilty about this. It's my life, and I don't really care what you think. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just get out. Get the hell out! Thank you. I just uh, came here tonight to hear that 90210 is a hit show. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is not the, the typical story that we do on uh, 90210. Um, and it came about because we got a 24-episode um, order, and we needed something that would motivate some stories besides, um, you know, my bikini's too small this week, or... <laughs> Which is, you know, a lot of our fun and our entertainment and, and most of what our show is about is about extremely wealthy, very beautiful people having a lot of fun. Um, and they're very, their lives are very unrelatable. Um, and so to get some storyline where, um, you know, the audience who pretty much watches to see something that's unrelatable and fun could identify and could also kind of motivate stories going forward. We, you know, we had to sort of look in other areas. We actually weren't, you know, um, looking for another a cancer story. Um, you know, we were trying to find things that impacted these characters' lives and something that we could do. And and it came up uh, regarding a, a different character. Maybe maybe there was something medical. And as we went around and around, because um, I'd worked on private practice and was pretty much aware of every medical story known to man, um, this character, uh, her mother on the show, had died of breast cancer a few seasons earlier. So we, you know, I said, well, if anybody is going to face medical blah blah blah, um, it was it's going to be her, and and um, it's going to, you know, it would be this BRCA gene story, which again, I only knew about from television. <laughs> Um, even though half my staff knows Jessica, none of them, <laughs> none of them spoke up and said, "What about a BRCA gene story?" <laughs> um, so again, though, the, a big difference um, between uh, there's many differences between private practice and 90210. Um, <laughs> you know, one of them is that um, 90210 does not have a full time medical consulting staff and researchers, um, and another being, you know, it's not a medical show, and it's not something that we ne normally go to the network and say we want to do, um, we want to do something that's going to put us in the hospital or, you know, uh, this kind of story. Um, so originally what we thought we were going to do uh, was simply do the story about taking the test and whether or not you should take the test. And who really wants to know their future? And we thought that was a pretty uh, non-medical uh, but relatable story about just dealing with, do you want to know um, information when the answer, and there's, only, there's one answer that frees you, and then the other answer just you know, leads you down this road with uh, 100 more questions and makes your life more complicated. Um, so uh, again, having been on private practice and had it definitely drilled into me that you don't do anything without any medical stories without talking to a doctor, um, we called Hollywood Health and um, Society to you know to get us in touch with somebody to just fact check and things like that. And um, 
you know, the general approach to uh, talking to doctors that I had done um, while working on a medical show was that you come up with the story you want to tell, and then you tell them, this is the story I want to tell, and then they tell you, well, it doesn't usually happen that way. And then you say, but I need to tell the story where it happens the way it never happens. So, you know, that's, that's the story that they want to hear. They don't want to hear the every time somebody has this condition, this happens. So you kind of walk them through those, those steps till you get them to agree that the story that you wanted to tell could be told <laughs> and, you know, you won't get sued or something like that. Um, but when we talk to the doctors, um, you know, they were so incredibly helpful um, in talking to us about other aspects of the, the story than just taking the test for the BRCA gene. And, you know, basically, as we kind of, what we're, our biggest fear was because these characters are supposed to be 19 years old, um, was that is this realistic uh, for a pro as a problem for a 19-year-old? You know, can't, can't they really put this off? And, and is, it, is it eminent enough? Um, but as we were talking to the doctors about it, you know, they started talking about some other materials, um, a documentary that they knew about, which we never would have found. Um, it was it, an extremely, you know, tiny self-financed documentary by a woman who'd been through basically what Jessica had been through. Um, and we watched that, and it kind of, you know, opened our eyes to the fact that there was um, a story that fit our show because it was an emotional story, and it was a relationship story, and it was exactly what um, our young female audience most cared about, which is, you know, if I'm dealing with this situation, what is that going to do to my love life? What is that going to do to my future? Um, am I ever going to have kids? I didn't even know I wanted kids, you know. So all of those kind of things were like, well, that is that is our show because that doesn't live in hospitals. Um, and it's not a, a lot of technical information. It's, a, it's about what does one small piece of information or, you know, what turns out to be a large piece of information due to all of these other aspects of my life. So um, at that point, you know, we had, we had started the, the story. The network was, um, was happy with the idea of taking a test. They thought that the test was going to come back negative. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it clearly was a better story that the test came back positive and that was going to have a bigger impact. Um, so, shockingly, her results came back. She, she has the cancer gene and, um, and that kind of pushed the story forward. Um, I'll pre-answer the question about whether or not the network ever didn't want to see anything. The only, uh, I've, uh, we get very few comments from the president of the, of the network, mainly, um, can we have more music? And can they be in bikinis more? Uh, so we did get a comment as soon as the, when the character was diagnosed with the, with the cancer gene, there was a flurry of, uh, of phone calls that I think ruined executives' days all over town because apparently it would, it ping-ponged between, you know, the, the head of the, uh, head of the network said something to the head of the studio and the head of the studio said, what? What are we doing on 90210? And it <laughs> went back and forth to different levels of executives until they called us up and said, she's not going to get all cut up, is she? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, we, you know, we had to say, well, not on camera. No, you'll be, you'll be all right. <laughs> only, only if the show goes 10 seasons, uh, you know, that'll be okay. Um, but it, the the information that we got, which was so valuable to us, has really launched a story that's carried us into the the finale in a big way, and hopefully is going to um, continue into into a season five, if there's a season five, and uh, there'll be many more calls uh, for the 
for our medical consultation. Um, so, and I'd just like to say, in terms of, I know why uh, correct medical information is so important to shows like Grey's Anatomy and private practice and things like that. They obviously sort of live and die based on those. Normally, I think they, they wouldn't, no one cared but us uh, that 90210 was, was getting um, medical consultation, was, was trying to be accurate. Um, the reason to be accurate is, I think, twofold. One of it, uh, reason obviously, is because so many people experience this and people know what's right and wrong. They, they recognize the story as being true or they recognize that that's bullshit. And, um, you know, and you don't want to dishonor people's actual experience. But I think the other reason for shows to, to be accurate and to do the research is because it makes more story. Um, it gives you more than a three episode arc, a two episode arc. This has been um, the arc for you know our last ten episodes and is spawning uh, an arc into another season. So the information that you that you get and that you can use um, can just make your make your jobs a lot easier. Thank you. I know. So we would like to, this is really stunning actually to hear Jessica's story and then to hear Patty talk about her work and see her clip because, you know, they're just, there's so much affinity and we'd like to give you a chance to ask some questions and I um, would like to start, we're going to come back to you because there was a piece of the story we wanted to share, um, but I'd like to start with Stacy and are you here, Stacy? There you are. Okay, great. Um, Stacy is with um, I'm Too Young for This uh, Cancer Foundation, and we'd like to hear from you first. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy. Can everyone hear me? No, let's get her a microphone. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, I am with what is now formally the I'm Too Young for This Cancer Foundation. We've rebranded ourselves with our slogan, which is sub subsequently stupid cancer. Um, I am a young adult cancer survivor. I'm 27. At the age of 20, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in the throes of my college career. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. So Patty looks like you and I should talk. <laughs> um, Stupid Cancer is an organization. We are the nation's largest young adult advocacy group for young adults living with cancer. Um, I met five years ago Matthew Zachary, who's the founder of the organization and another young adult cancer survivor, actually on the set of Lifetime Side Order of Life, which was a little show that had a character with cancer. Margaret Nagel created it, and that was my first job in television as a PA. Um, unfortunately, I turned to the dark side and now work in reality television, so don't hate me. Um, but that's where I met Matt, and Matt was consulting with Margaret, who created the show, on portraying the character most accurately. Um, and I joined forces with Matt and grew within the organization and I'm now a board member of the organization. And we are an organization that is run entirely by young adults living with cancer. All volunteers. All volunteers. Um, that's what I do. That's my story. And um, I'd love to talk to everybody else more about this and help in the educational process. Um, that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, maybe you could just um, raise your hands, and we'll go ahead and get started there. Hello, I'm John. I have a question for Patty Carr, and I apologize if this is really, really left field. But in addition to everything that you do, you happen to were one of the writers on one of my favorite all-time shows, Boy Meets Boy World. Boy Meets World. I was going to say it must be Boy Meets uh, World. <laughs> I'm going to be really bold and ask if afterwards you would sign my copy of uh, Boy Meets World Season 7. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. All right, that's all I need to know. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody else on the panel. You guys are amazing. You're my inspiration, so thank you. Okay, there's a hand here. Right here. Right here. Oh, I didn't see that. Looking the wrong way. Uh, in terms of our responsibility uh, as uh, communicators and working with media, uh, <clears throat> scale and proportion. Now, I had never heard of BRCA before. Tonight, I heard a story. I saw it on one television show. Now I saw it on two television shows. So <clears throat> how do we start to deal with 
uh, I don't know how rare it is or whether what you're asking is everybody, every woman to get screened. Because that's one question, because if there are indicators that every woman doesn't have to, then that's another situation. So if it looks like we're promoting television that it looks like something that's very rare isn't, what are we doing there? And how do we, how do we make sure that everything gets represented properly? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Who would like to go ahead? You want to start? Uh, well, first of all, it's rare, but it's not very rare. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, maybe we can share this question, but um, I, I guess one in every 10 cases of breast cancer are hereditary, so nine out of 10 are random. Mm -hmm. But um, one out of 10 uh, can be tested for, I mean, or, or, or there, there are different genes. There are two genes that are known, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Then there are genes of unknown origin that they're working on finding still every day. So it's possible to have a gen, I mean, I, I have friends who have had breast cancer, their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, and yet they test negative for BRCA, and the doctors say, we know this is genetic, it's a gene that we haven't yet um, discovered. But basically, the doctors advise me and um, everyone I know that if you have a strong history of breast cancer, which means a mother, a sister, an aunt, if you know, um, in your family to be tested. But that said, my, my, it can also come from the father's side. Right. So we didn't know about the history in my family because it was m from my mother's father and he was a deadbeat dad and stuff. Right. So we didn't know about that side of the family. But it's also predominantly found in Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. So it's very um, important for the Jewish. <laughs> it's probably been on house. It's, it's been on in treatment. It's been almost everywhere by now. So I think to make the point that um, like what is too much and what is scalable. So both of the stories, well all the stories we've heard tonight have been in context of the family history. So that's where you start and so both were correct that way. So it is scalable. Okay, there's a hand back here. Jessica. Um, I just wanted to tell you that um, I read your book when I was recovering from my mastectomy this past year, and um, I'm BRCA1. I found out after losing my mom, and I did all the research I needed to and saw surgeons and made the decision not to have a prophylactic mastectomy. And um, you were not crazy. I was. <laughs> so I think that what you did was incredibly important. And um, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time, and I'm really honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, hi, I'm Roger Holzberg. I went the opposite path from Jessica. I was diagnosed with cancer, and I left entertainment and went to work for the National Cancer Institute to tell stories. Oh. Our two physicians posed both said, um, you can't tell, you can't really can't tell the story in half an hour in, in any kind of depth. And I really want to ask the showrunners, how are you tying transmedia into your stories? Because when someone hears that story on 90210, they don't come to the National Cancer, they don't come to cancer.gov. <laughs> they go to 90210.com. And is there follow through through those stories to, to, to give the direction, the deeper learnings that patients or people need to get once they get introduced to subjects that are presented on the shows. So do you want to take a, I, go ahead. I don't really want to take it, I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. um, you know what, I, I got to be uh, totally honest, there's a, there, I think there's a little bit of a, um, there's a nervousness in, in, in having, because uh, we've had some requests from cancer f foundations, people who want to line up with us. But that becomes kind of a tricky world because a couple of things, then I, I feel like then we really have to like walk a certain line. Uh, you know, I mean, we're not a medical show. We're not a documentary. We're not a truth-telling show. Um, um, I, I always say that this, this is about entertainment, and yet I, I'm so honored that, um, that people watch us and find comfort or... or um, uh, you know, f can can relate and um, but the actual it becomes a really tricky 
a tricky thing to really want to to tie into a known group because it, so so I don't know how to answer you I, I don't know that um, I'm not totally sure if if we are tied into a group. That's a little bit of a showtime issue. Yeah. They kind of make those choices, and and I don't know what all goes into them them aligning with any particular group to say, hey, get more information here or there or whatever. Um, but but I, I know that, that this subject has been come up has come up a little bit, and and it always makes us nervous to to feel like we're selling somebody else's point of view or or whatever, so. I, so. The only use is kind of one evidence-based group in the country, and we pay for it as taxpayers, and there's no profit motive at NPI, so. Right. Well, Roger, thank you very much for asking that question, and I'll just share with the audience and, and maybe even some of the panelists that uh, this is one of the things that Hollywood Health and Society does with the shows, and it's often not through the writers and producers. It's through their dot-coms. So it would be CW.com, NBC.com, ABC.com, so when the writers, we've consulted on a story and they tell us when they're going to air that story, we'll contact the .com and offer them web links to credible sources of information. Right. And we actually also, um, so the way, we're like the bridge group. So we go to the CDC and we say, can you write a, a bunch of tweets on the BRCA gene? They send them to us. We contact um, the, uh, the .com or an executive you know, with the network, CW Network, and we say, here are the tweets. You know, if you want, we'd love for you to tweet to your fan base with the facts. And here are some web links, and we often place web links on the show's websites. Sometimes the writers and producers aren't involved in that at all. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes not their decision. But I don't know, Patty, if you have anything to say. Well, I, I just to speak to that from uh, for our show, and um, and then maybe someone can, can correct this if it's, um, if I'm wrong. Um, we did talk about doing uh, a PSA as, as associated with the, the ARC. Um, the problem that we felt like we were running into was that the BRCA gene is privately owned mm -hmm. and the, there's only one company that does the test and it's for profit. So to give people information that would encourage them to use Whole that service story. becomes, <laughs> it is, and it's a very compelling story as well, um, and that somebody should tell on a show. But, <laughs> but um, it, it became a, a sort of a legal difficulty of we tend to, in the past, they've only done a PSA for, they, they have very sp sort of specific criteria, and it's always nonprofit. I didn't know how to do a PSA for this particular situation that didn't bump up against that. That is very interesting. And, and actually, we worked with uh, 90210 on the bipolar disorder storyline. And mm -hmm. Silver also is bipolar, yeah. right? She's okay, a, she's Silver's got it all. <laughs> uh, but in that case, uh, the show did have a PSA, and the um, Let's see, bipolar, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in DC, helped us write the copy, mm -hmm. which we sent to the show, and they had the lead actor appear, and they referred viewers to both a landing page with a nonprofit organization and uh, a call-in hotline number. Mm -hmm. And they had huge traffic mm -hmm. peaks, thanks to the, sh the storyline and this PSA. So, I mean, works. we would be happy, we'd be happy to do it if we could if we knew what, how to do the PSA with, without basically advertising. It's just like super yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's helping, you know, mine that data for you and bring in the sources. We actually mm -hmm. placed over 800 web links on shows last year, and we had 221 storylines air with accurate health information in them mm -hmm. that we consulted on. Mm -hmm. Bring up um, Dr. Thank you. Um, Dr. Richardson was talking about prevention, and Dr. Chasal was talking about how in Lancaster, certainly people seem less educated in this area. And there's been a tremendous amount of resources beginning to come to light that's existed for a long time that what we're putting into our bodies, nutrition and lifestyle, play a dramatic role mm -hmm. in the growth of cancer. Yep. 
I mean, I believe that we all, unfortunately, can get cancer. Aside from genetic pieces, it's what we're doing to our bodies and what the environment is doing to us. And yet, I haven't seen on shows, yes, in some documentaries, but on entertainment, where a character chooses, let me change the way I'm eating, let me change my lifestyle, and I personally have a friend who was given a terminal diagnosis and said, I'm going to change the outcome. And she became a totally plant-based eater and tr lost a tremendous amount of weight, exercised, and was supposed to die within three years and is alive 12 years later. Mm. So I would like to know if this is something the writers have considered introducing, and has it ever been potentially a problem with the advertisers that might be on the shows? <laughs> um, because my friend who's here recently pitched um, to help fight obesity a show and was told that, but we have Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's as our advertisers, so we, we can't accept the show even though it sounds wonderful. So I'd like to ask that question. Okay, who would like to? So, I think I'm the only, I think so I'm the me, only one with yeah. advertising. <laughs> well, you know, we have a, um, I'm sorry, did someone jump in? Uh, okay. We have um, uh, Susan Sarandon is doing an arc on our um, uh, third season, which um, none of which is aired yet. But but she's a, a plays a breast cancer survivor who now does public speaking on the subject, and and she um, uh, you know her character is all about juicing and and is actually sponsored by a juicer. Um, and so that kind of plays into the story. We, we had talked a lot about sending the main character into this wellness center where they, where they do. We watched a documentary about people, uh, a wellness center in, in New York, where they you know, changed their life by, um, by doing exactly what you're talking about, dramatically changing your diet and so forth. Um, and we found that compelling and really thought that that could be a road to lead Kathy down. Um, you know, in the end, it kind of morphed into something else because our characters are, are it's more about relationships and, and points of view. Um, and so it turned into her uh, bumping up against this, this character um, and kind of following her, her uh, for a while and, and, and her, she's a joyologist and, and a motivational speaker and, and a very joyologist. compelling um, a speaker who, who does believe in juicing and the whole thing. So it kind of morphed into that. Now, do I think you're going to love that because we're selling that this is a great way to go and it can beat your cancer? No, we turn it on its ear and, and we, we play into some intricacies in terms of the character. We don't, um, we absolutely don't take the point of view that this doesn't work. The point being, we recognized it as, as something cancer survivors, people fighting their cancer, we recognized it as something people are doing. So so that is spoken to in the series. As far as taking, you know, uh, uh, you know, focusing on it or making it kind of a soapbox issue, not so much, but, but we acknowledge it. That's great. Did you want to say anything, Patty? Uh, just, I mean, we, we haven't gone to that place in the, in the show, and obviously she's just been tested for, for the gene. Um, that said, I don't know that we would get resistance on the from the advertisers. Um, I think in our particular case, the fact that we are a show for young women, mm -hmm. and it's um, our young women are extremely thin, <laughs> um, <laughs> that the idea of them going on the, a diet and proponent, mm -hmm. pushing the fact that a re very restrictive diet is healthy, that would be where I would think we would run into problems. You know, I think it's very dependent on who your audience is, and you have to speak to your audience and, and recognize that you may be trying to address one issue and bringing up, you know, a, another issue altogether. Let me chime in a little bit. So, you know, part of the information that you are seeking is so complicated mm -hmm. that there is no right answer to that. So we don't have specific... Um, established guidelines that this is right, that is wrong, and there is still a huge market for all these supplemental medications, which we don't know how to deal with. I mean, I deal with this and my chemotherapy patients who are on five different supplements, and we really don't know what it does to the chemotherapy, what it does to the liver. So delving into that without having the real science, when there are a thousand other companies trying to promote their product and uh, overwhelming, and that is where I think part of your job becomes a runaway. So 
every breast cancer patient coming in and wanting a BRCA test now takes another half an hour trying to discuss that 90%, more than 90, 95% of the patients don't qualify for the test. And the problem is not just the positive or negative test. The problem is what is called the of indeterminate significance. So now you have a mutation that we know doesn't cause cancer, but there's a mutation. We don't know what to do, do with that. I think this is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me give another example. I have, I do a huge melanoma clinic, so I have 100 brochures in my hand. I give it to the patients about sunscreen, uh, you know, UV index. It is not glamorous at all. And when they see 90210, everybody is beautiful and thin and tan, and they go to a tanning booth. It all erodes, it all erases all of that, uh, <coughs> the handouts. I, I don't think it is so simple to say, okay, this is the party line, this is what we follow, this is what we promote in the show. Um, it is, there is so much information, so much noise, uh, not all of which is true. Well, thank you all. We, um, we've actually run out of time. Please stay after and, and talk with our guests. I want to thank you for an incredibly inspiring and informative evening. Thank you. Thank our, let's give our panelists a warm thank you. Also, if you would look in your packets, there is a blue sheet. We would really appreciate it if you would take a minute to fill these out. It's really to give us feedback on the evening what we did well, what suggestions you might have for the future. And for those writers here in the room, if you're working on a health storyline or anything related to climate change, and you'd like access to an expert or any facts checked or any information, call us. We're a free resource to the community. Thank you.